Rebecca, if we talked to you, did um, when we were at the Saturday Night Circuit Club, did we talk with you after the service? She wasn't there. Oh, you weren't there. Okay. We had this experience where um, during worship, the Spirit of the Lord hit me, and He said, "I'm in the back of the room." Like my glory is in the back of the room, and I thought, "What does that mean?" And then I had a hard time doing the message. And then I went up to these guys and said, "Hey." I think the glory of the Lord's in the corner of the room. And I thought they just go, you know, just great, Brian, just go live life. And someone else was talking to me, and they went over there, and we kind of all walked over there and got kind of plastered by the presence of the Lord. It was actually in the corner of the room. And um, in fact, when we left, I think it was like three or four hours after that, we're still like being encountered by the Lord and going, what is going on? So, how many of you, as we're just here in the service, recognize that the Lord was here with us and he started increasing his power. Yeah. Did you guys recognize that? Mm -hmm. okay. okay, did you guys get a sense of his presence somewhere in the room manifesting or anything? Or did it was just a general? General. general. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. I was looking. Were you? Okay, good. <laughs> so, um, what's really difficult is we're, we're right in the middle of God beginning to do something. We are. But, but where we're not able to project is what the depth of it is going to look like. So I encourage you guys, start asking God. In fact, right before Cliff got up, I felt like the Lord wanted me to just make a pronouncement of prayer over us. So join me in this just for a moment. Lord, we welcome you to release your power and your glory in the midst of us. Uh, we want to behold your glory. And we, we set ourselves apart for however you want to do that in our lives. And we just bless you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, guys. Uh, I'm not going to go as long as I usually do. Would you grab your Bibles real quick? We'll do Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 and 2. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 and 2. All right. I'm um, still working on faith with everybody. Um, I thought, and I've shared with you before, that I believe that this was a simple concept, and I was amazed on how confusing it is to the body of Christ. And so hopefully this will give for us, us here tonight, um, some clarification on the idea of how faith is worked in a Christian experience. All right, so Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 and 2 tells us this. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it, the men of old gained approval. So it's now defining faith as the assurance of things hoped for. So what we want to do is we want to explore this and say, okay, so it's telling us that faith is a certain quality of something. So what is quality of biblical faith compared to you and I um, asserting or trying to trust in our own ability. First thing you need to understand is when the word faith is used, it's always described from Scripture as a gift from God. It's always described as a gift from God. So there's this kind of really interesting thing that um, we started uh, I'm trying to figure out when it was, I, I think it was probably when the healing ministry started getting reintroduced in a greater measure in the body of Christ. People ran into obstacles and they're like, well, I don't understand why Jesus isn't healing that person. And so when I look at scripture, Jesus would say things like, well, according to your faith. And so I guess they assume that meant you don't have enough faith. And then that kind of teaching started going forward. Yeah. Uh, and so what that's done is it's caused the body of Christ to misunderstand this concept of what biblical faith is. There's human faith, and then there's biblical or God-given faith. So God-given faith is always a gift from God. It's never something you produce. All right. Please understand, the original language, the way it's even used in Scripture, it's never something you you possess. Okay? So when Jesus would say things like, according to your faith, and everyone thinks, oh, he's saying your faith, but he's saying, when you look at that word according in the original language, it means that they're drawing from a higher dimension 
That's the faith they're having, and he's saying, according to that faith, you're going to be healed. Does that make sense, you guys? And so we don't see that nuance when it's in, in the English translation, but in the Greek it's very specific. According means to draw from another source, and so he's saying that type of faith is the faith that heals, delivers, saves, raises people from the dead. All right? So, for the believer, we would call faith divine persuasion. Therefore, it is different from what human faith is. Human faith is confidence. It's, it's what's called a mental assent to something. So, everybody, because you and I are made in the image of God, have an ability to read truth and go, I understand that, and that makes sense, so I'll come into agreement with it. And that's human faith. That is not the ability to do anything in the kingdom because you have to be given the gift of faith. All right, so, illustration. Um, I was trying to, um, here we are back with Lutherans again in Minnesota. I was trying to teach them a basic principle that all the things that Jesus did was based on the presence of God. It wasn't based on, I learned to do this and so it works. It's all serving of people, worship, reading the scripture, your, even your prayer life is not based on effort that you make. It's learning to grab onto the presence of God and basically, if I can say this in the right way, go wherever he's at and learning to mold your will to become receptive to the moving of the Holy Spirit. Excuse me. And... Um, so we're in a room of a couple hundred people, and I'm uh, Lutherans, and I'm saying, all right, so as a group, why don't we just take 10 minutes and ask the Holy Spirit to bring his presence? So we are, you know, it's hard to do this in any size group. We're like, so Holy Spirit, would you come? And, and uh, do it just like Kelly was doing in worship. We just started thanking the Lord, describing his goodness. And, and because people don't know what to do with just being quiet, so I'm like, well, let's just become thankful. And so periodically we're Holy Spirit, we bless your name. And um, I always, you guys are like I am, right? I want the, the moving of the Holy Spirit to be authentic. So you don't have, when God is moving, you don't have to prompt people to respond. The Holy Spirit ministers to them, and you have to teach them not to quench that. And so people respond to the Holy Spirit. And this woman, I think she was in the second row, and I had noticed her before the meeting that she had had a bandana around her head and that she was bald. And so obviously you guys know that that means that she has some form of cancer and she's lost her hair from that. Well, during while we're waiting on the Lord of just kind of, Lord, just bring more of your power and more of your glory. And we just bless your name. And she started... Um, um, going, wow, and I mean, she even said it really loud and true. Wow, it's really hot right now. I mean, I am just starting to burn up, right? So she's saying that. And as we're just, well, I'm not, and I'm trying to encourage her, okay, but just keep focusing on the Lord, and we're going, and then she's she's going, no, I'm, I'm serious. My head is on fire right now. <laughs> that was so bad. And she, and she, I'm just like, okay, but just keep focusing on the Lord. And now she's screaming. She goes, my head is so hot. I mean, she's screaming now. My head is so hot. And she goes, I think I'm healed. Right? So that's what she yells to everybody. Mm. And I'm trying to make everyone just focus on the presence of the Lord. And I said, okay, if you believe Jesus has healed you, obviously, if you go to your doctor, he'll confirm that and just share that with you. I didn't ask her about it. I wasn't trying to focus on that. Now think about this. I'm telling you what faith is. It's based on the presence of God coming and doing something. Well, she comes back the next month. I didn't even ask her what she, I knew she had some form of cancer, and she said she was healed, but I don't know what she was healed of. But she comes back and says, uh, they did, I have brain cancer. Uh, they basically told me that they had done everything they could for me. And they had basically sent me home to die. And the Spirit of the Lord came and healed me last month. She says, I'm completely healed of brain cancer. Now, you guys ready? God produced that in her. The presence of the Lord is what produces faith. And so, a lot of times when we begin to talk about these subjects, 
we focus on, well, okay, here's faith, and here's the gifts of the Spirit. Here, and, what, and what we always do is we put them in like, well, how do I learn to do that? How do I learn to do that? The foundation of all of it is the presence of the Lord. So I grow in faith by enjoying the presence of the Lord. I grow in giftedness by enjoying, enjoying the presence of the Lord. Well, that's what it's telling us now. It's saying faith is the assurance. All right, so let's work at the word assurance here. Now, this is one of the Greek words for the word hope. Now, when's the last time you guys had any kind of um, teaching on hope biblical? Has it been a while? Okay, so foundationally, the Christian experience is what? When it says in 1 Corinthians 13, these three remain, faith, hope, and love. Uh, what a lot of people, and then it says the greatest of these is love. The way you need to look at that passage, it's, it's describing hope and faith as a connection to the deeper concept of love. So if like a tree was growing, and we would use biblical concepts to describe a growing of the tree, the root system in God is the love of God. That's the root system. As it starts growing in a person's soul, what does it produce? Hope and faith, right? The love of God as it goes deeper, so you guys ready? There's a rhythm with the Lord Jesus Christ. There are seasons where he calls you to go deeper into his love. And then there are seasons that as you go deeper, he commands you to fan out in a greater depth to express faith and hope. So here it's tying the concept of what is faith. He ties it to the concept of hope, and that's the word for assurance here. So here's what it, uh, the word, this Greek word for it, epis means hope, but it's an actively waiting on God to fulfill the thing he's released inside of you. And so it would be the idea that you're, you're in birth, that's the way the, the Greek word is used, with the power of his love, right? So God, when we say faith is the assurance, before we get to the thing, the concept of uh, things hoped for, this word assurance really is the idea of an actively waiting on the birthing of the power of God's love inside of you. So God starts working in you. That's God's love that's doing it, but that's describing it as an energy surge that actually helps you. Right? And you learn to wait on it. It would, that's why some of the illustrations that we give about this stuff, it, it, people are like, well, how do I live that in my everyday life? It means when God is beginning to do something in you, whether he's showing you something in his word or leading you in prayer for something or telling you to minister to somebody, an awakening of God connects with you. And he's saying if you wait on it and nurture it and enjoy it, what will happen is this power of God's love will start rising up in you and all of a sudden you'll step over the bridge. Now what's the bridge that everybody struggles with? Doubt and fear. And so God's love is more powerful to get you over that bridge. So faith is the assurance of what? Things hoped for. So what does that mean? Hoped for. Okay, so now this word for hope is the next word for the word biblical hope. Alright, now what is biblical hope? It, the contrast in scripture is this. The hope of the righteous make them glad. I think it's Proverbs 13, verse 12. The hope of the righteous make you glad, but the hope of the wicked, or I'm sorry, the expectation of the wicked leads to despair. And it's using the concept of hope and expectation. So over here, the hope of the righteous leads to gladness. Now why does it do that? Because biblical hope, you ready, is looking into heaven, recognizing what is normal up there, Ready? Grabbing onto God and pulling it into time. That's biblical hope. That's why it leads to gladness, because it's based on truth and reality. What God's rea ultimate reality in heaven is what he wants released on earth. You and he discover it by him sharing his heart with you, and then you come into agreement with it, and then God causes it to come forth. That's why it's the assurance of something hoped for. God says, here's what I want for your family. 
here's what I want for your nation. Here's what I want. And then you say, all right, I agree to that. And then when you agree to it, a dynamic gets released. It's not just God saying, here's what I hope will happen. It might not happen. And the way that hope is used by people that don't know the word is they use it as a term for wishing about something. Yeah. I hope I win the lottery. Or I hope I get a red Ferrari. Or I hope I get the island of Hawaii. Uh, that's great, but that, that sounds like fantasy. Well, that's not the biblical concept of hope. For the believer, hope is what we call something you sink your teeth into because it's real. And you can depend on God doing it because it's already what God has determined in heaven, and now you're saying, just let it be on earth. That prayer that Jesus teaches us, let it your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So, here, look how we're getting this described. Now, faith... The God-given gift is actually the end-breathing power of God being released inside of you so that what God's will is in heaven, you bring it down into your existence. So, several years ago, I had gone to Guatemala and, and I got this Montezuma's Revenge and some kind of weird stomach thing going on and I, and I kept like going to the doctor and he'd give me antibiotics and he was just tearing my colon up. It was one of the best experiences of my life. And on top of me trying to get rid of whatever this parasite was in my colon, uh, because of all the antibiotics that I was taking, I got an inflamed sciatic nerve pain, if you guys have ever had that. So the condition was getting worse, not better, as anyone want to say. Glory, hallelujah. <laughs> so I'm trying to figure out, so I'm trying to, from reading scripture, I'm trying to figure out, and guys, if you don't, so just so you know my background, um, when I was a teenager living here in Colorado, I used to just go get drunk with my friends all the time. And when I was in college, I got drunk. And so I was just a, a, a sort of a semi-alcoholic, uh, weird college student. So when I got saved, God delivered me of that. So I don't drink, ever, for any reason. I was so desperate. I'm reading where Paul's telling Timothy, well, you know, drink a little wine. And I remember laying, being in my house going, I can't believe I have to drink wine to see if this is going to actually deal with this. But when you're desperate, you try anything. <laughs> well, I, I got tipsy, but it didn't heal my back. So I thought, all right. Now, <laughs> do you guys realize that when you need to be healed, you try everything? I'll, I'll listen to testimonies. I'll do this. I'll pay it. I did all that and none of it happened. So I finally, uh, it's amazing how stubborn I am. I don't, hopefully you guys aren't like me. I finally turned to the Lord and go, uh, seriously, are you gonna heal me? And he said, I've been waiting for you to ask. I thought, really, all that? He said, Brian, it isn't that I don't wanna heal you. I wanna heal you a specific way. And you have to come to me and ask me. And I'm like, come on, well, how do you wanna heal me? And he said, well, what I want you to do is every day I want you to lay hands on your back, invite my presence, and command the pain to leave, and you'll be healed. Now, God spoke to me. When he spoke that to me, faith was released inside of me. But I had to walk it out for the next month. And two weeks into it, I lost that experience. And now I'm having to do it as a, well, God said it, but I don't have a sense of it, and I'm praying over myself. And I'm just doing it by rote, and probably about the third week of it, I was doing it in disgust. Have you guys ever done that? I heard God told me to do this. Do it anyways. No, just the Holy Spirit come, make me feel uh, 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 uh. So when people think, wow, when you, you're giving God faith, it's like you raise up to this place, and you're always there, and there's never a struggle. Well, I mean, just look like at the people in Scripture, or look at your own life. That's not the way it works. You people go back and forth, and you have doubt, and then and you think, well, if I have doubt, that means God's going to be mad at me. No, that's any of that. That's just what it's like to walk these things out. You're, you're going to have, by the way, if God gives you faith for something, and he's demanding you to walk it through more than a week, the enemy's going to attack you and tell you God's a liar, and then he's going to go after that kind of stuff, Right? Yeah, God, yeah, God promised that, but you know he's not going to do that, or you know you don't have that faith. All that kind of nonsense that comes from the enemy. Everybody goes through that. So after a month of praying for my back, I started knowing, noticing around the month point, the pain was getting less severe. But you guys, have any of you ever had a sciatic nerve pain? <laughs> it, it's in your back, and it goes down your leg, and it things inflamed all the time. And so I wasn't getting sleep. And, and could you imagine, four weeks into this, and <laughs> and 
and nothing's <laughs> happening. <laughs> and I noticed, thanks John for laughing at me. Uh, and so I noticed around the fourth the fourth week, I'm just laying, I'm just doing it by rope. You told me to do this. I'm gonna do this. I guess this will be the rest of my life. This is what I'll be doing. And I noticed the pain was starting to lift off. About four and a half weeks into it, every day of doing this, I'm just doing it. It's it's more. I have to get ready for work. Holy Spirit, come bring your power, and I'm just ripping through it as fast as I can. And I realize I don't have any pain. And I'm like, that's weird. And so, if you ever have God heal you this way, it worked, and I didn't believe it because I had, had struggled with it so much that I tried to re-injure my back just to see if God healed it, but it was actually healed. <laughs> Thank you guys. All right. So, why am I telling this to you? Because the way I watch people talk about walking out things in faith, it, they talk like they never have a struggle. And so, for the rest of us, we hear that and they think, "Really? Are there are these people like super Christians among us, or are they walking in a dimension I don't understand?" And so, everybody assumes there's not this struggle that goes on with this stuff. And in reality, you guys ready? Every time God calls you towards something to believe or receive the gift of faith, the enemy wants to steal it from you. He, uh, you have people trying to talk you out of it. I mean, you have this whole warfare thing that goes around walking this out. That's why when it's going through faith in Hebrews chapter 11, it's pointing to people and saying, now look what they really had to go through when God talked to them about stuff. He tells Abraham, and Abraham goes and talks Sarah into doing it the exact opposite way that God told him to. Uh, you have Noah, and he got persecuted. How would you like a hundred year word in your life? You're going to flood the world, and you have to believe that for a hundred years. Can you imagine that? And you're building this thing, and everybody's like, you're out of your mind. <laughs> okay. So are you guys ready? We're, we're kind of all in the same Jesus boat with each other. And what, what we've done is we try to act like people that have been given faith, they've rised above the place of doubt or struggle, and that's what real biblical faith looks like. But you guys are ready? Faith comes, it energizes you, and if you have to walk it out, you have a struggle. And that's why they use the idea that faith is like a shield, because things are going to come against it. And so how do you, how do you sustain Faith. And now it comes to this. Faith is the assurance of, of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. So let's work, up, work on the word conviction. <laughs> so funny. I know. Uh, yeah, I know. I'll mention those fighters here in a minute. Let's get through this. All right, two Greek words under and to stand. Hypostasis. Hypostasis. Hello. So what does that actually mean? All right, so when it says it's the conviction, real quick, the conviction of things not seen, this word actually means a title deed. So when it says that God is going to give you a conviction, he's saying, I'm pulling it out of the realm of how you feel about it, and what I've done is I've given you a title deed to something. So here's the important part. When God says, I'm going to do this in your life, you might feel it. That's how the gift of faith feels. You have an assurance of it. But there has been a legal contract that has been signed from heaven and given to you. And that's the word for conviction in this. So you guys ready? If God says, I'm going to do this for your family, and he says it to you maybe five years ago, he's actually signed a contract with you that he cannot break regardless of how long it takes. Uh, do you guys realize that? So in Hebrews 11, where he's talking about some people, they actually died before they got the promise, but God still fulfilled the promise because he signed a contract with them. That's what the word conviction means here. By the way, why is it so important for you to realize God's signing a contract with you? He's actually giving you the title deed to something when he speaks to you about something. Because a lot of times everyone bases it on, well, can I trust the word of the Lord? Can I trust God to do what he says? So what he does is he says, not only am I going to make you experientially have the effect of faith, I'm going to put a title deed of it where I'm actually guaranteeing this, this thing I'm going to do for you. Uh, by the way, you, you guys, here we are in time. 
And how many of you believe that you've met the Lord Jesus Christ, and when your time is done on this planet, you're going to go be with him? How many of you believe that? Well, you haven't experienced it yet, so why do you trust that? Because God has given you a title deed. He said, look, I'm planning on doing this. You need to grab onto this, and this is what you need to put your understanding in, because I'm not ready a liar. I don't lie when I give things. I give conviction. So he's, he lets you experience it experientially. As you go through it, he says, this is also a legal document that I have actually given you. You can trust this thing. Mm -hmm. All right, so. <sighs> yeah, I'm not going to give that illustration. Let's do the last word. So it's the conviction of things I've seen. For by it, the men of old gained approval. All right, so let's work on this. What does approval mean here? All right, so what God does is this whole walk of faith. God speaks to you, the enemy challenges it, people speak against it, you go through all your own doubt, and as you're going through this process, there's a, most people look at it like linear. I'm going through this experience and then God answers it, but the way the scripture describes it is you're growing through the experience. So this whole entire struggle is making you more like the Lord Jesus Christ. And because of that, this term approval comes among it, and it says, well, the men of old, the people that walked by faith before you, here's what God did. It's through this struggle of faith that they went through, the approval of God was being sealed upon them to say, that's what it looks like to walk by faith. Now, why is the approval of God so important when it comes to this stuff? It means that God is writing an epistle over your life right now. Now, how many of you guys keep track of your God victories and write about it? You should be. Uh, just like they wrote about their history in God, and that's what you read now, you should be writing your own history in God to be given to whoever wants to read it, to your own family, or, or people that you just share with. You should be having your own testimony. Are you guys ready? As you go through this process, the approval, the stamp, you're just like the people that walked before you. It's being given to you, but it's greater than that. It's the approval of what we would call the witness that God's favor is resting upon you. All right, last idea, and then we'll be done. This happened here in Colorado. I, I was down at the Rock, right? This is way, I think this was, it was. It's right after they had just got them building the, the new building. And they were starting to have services in there. And Jer brought me in for a weekend service, and I don't remember what I was covering. That's not the important thing. But it was a Sunday morning, and then they had a prayer time. And so uh, I gave some words of knowledge, and people came. And usually what would happen is, you guys, you guys were there, you, you know what it's like. You have a whole ministry team ministering to people, but for the speaker, there's always this line of people waiting for you. So I had like this whole line of people waiting for me to pray for them. So I'm praying with them, and people are starting to leave, and I still have this long line going up the middle aisle, and so I'm praying with them, and the sanctuary is emptying out, and it's just me and the people praying for them. And the very last person is this lady that comes up to me with her grandson. And she says, uh, I said, what would you like prayer for? And she goes, well, I'd like it for my grandson. And I said, well, what is he dealing with? And she goes, well, look. And she's holding him, and she kind of moves his leg, and he said, well, he was born where his, he has no life in this leg. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, my goodness, the very last person you've got to be kidding. And she goes, and he, had, and he has developmental problems in his brain, and they don't think he's ever going to be able to learn or any of that other stuff. Would you pray for him? Now, this is the last person. Now, are you guys like me? Not only is it the last one, I'm just like, I'm desperate. I, I mean, God, you've got to do this. This is just a, a terrible thing for them to be dealing with. That's how I'm starting to pray, and everybody says this, and I'm trying to be straightforward with you. There is no faith in me for this situation. I just thought, well, I'm going to pray. Hopefully the Lord shows up. And so I'm, I'm, I'm just, let's invite the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, come. And while we're waiting... I'm just like, what do you want me to do, Lord? He says, I want you to speak to the leg. And I said, well, how? And he just said, command it to be restored. So I said, in the name of Jesus, I command the leg to be restored, and I command the fluid to leave his brains. And then I said, well, how's he doing? And she kind of just dangles his leg, and it's just as deformed as it was. 
And I thought, well, there you go. I didn't hear the Lord. That was nonsense. And I said, well, thank you. Uh, please keep seeking prayer. And I watch her walk out of the sanctuary. Now, as she's walking out, this thing, this um, intensity, I, I don't know if it was anger. I don't, I don't know if I was disappointed. It was just all of that was mixed going on in my emotions. And I'm watching them leave, and I'm thinking, how long, Lord, is my prayer life going to be where no one gets better after I get down praying for them. I said, I'm so sick of that. I'm sick of that in the United States. And I mean, I just left. I left. That was a Sunday service, and I don't think I had anything after that. So somehow I got back home, and I remember being at home saying to the Lord, I'm tired of this. <laughs> I'm tired of praying for people. I'm tired that they don't get yeah. healed. I'm tired of trying to answer questions of why God doesn't heal in the United States. I'm just tired of all this stuff. And I've made an inner vow. I'm, I'm done with this. I'm going to just stop praying for the sick. I'm sick of this. <laughs> right? So I come back the next month. Well, I'm doing a school of the prophetic. So could you imagine coming to a school of prophetic and we're supposed to believe God for stuff and I've already made the determination a month later. I'm not going to do this anymore. So I'm just teaching. The, I'm uh, just kind of doing my thing. And here she comes into the set. I, I mean, trust me, I remember who she was. The grand, This was the grandmother. She comes up to me at the end of the teaching time in School of the Prophetic. And she says, hey, I need you to explain something to me. And I said, okay. And I thought she was going to say, because when you, if you guys ever prayed for someone and they don't get better, and then they come around to you and they go, why are you so wimpy at praying? Or what's wrong with her? Do you guys ever have those experiences? It's really a lot of fun. So I thought she was going to say, hey, I want to ask you why, you, why you're so wimpy at prayer or something. And so she's like, I have a question for you. And I thought, okay, here we go. She goes, let me tell you what happened after you prayed for him. And I thought, okay, well, here it comes. He, he got worse, right? And she's like, so I, this is obviously my grandson. I gave it back to my daughter. Two days later, my daughter needs to put him on the couch so that she can make lunch for him and her. And while she's in the kitchen making lunch, he comes running by her, hits the back door, and starts running in the back door of the plane. I went, I'm just looking at her like, what? And she said, yeah, he took him to the doctor. And the doctor did, uh, well, first, the doctor declared that he was healed. His leg was restored. But he had no, uh, the way she described it is he had fluid in his brain. She had no more fluid in his brain, and he's normal. So the, de the doctor declared that a miracle. Okay, so you guys ready? She's telling me that. What comes out of my soul? Unbelief. In fact, it was so intense, I yelled at her. I said, I, and I'm, I'm listening to myself say this to this woman. I won't believe it until I see him. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Jeez, I was like, why did I do that? I was like, I was being delivered or something. <laughs> so she said, yeah, I'll bring him next month. And, and I, I, I'm trying to process this thing with her. So, all right, so that meeting ends. And for the whole next month, I don't know if you guys ever have to walk through this stuff. I'm not getting sleep. Because I'm, what if she lied to me? What if this isn't true? And blah, 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 blah. And then the enemy thought, wow, I don't even have to attack him. He's doing his own <laughs> oppressing of himself. And, and I wake up in a cold sweat and I'm like, God, I wonder if God's actually going to do it. And by the time I got to the meeting, I was shaking, not from the Spirit of the Lord or anything else. I was so nervous that that wasn't, uh, she lied to me or something, all right? So she walks in before the, this is third, three months this takes for this to happen. The third month she shows up. And she walks through the door, and I'm looking at her, and I'm like, okay, here we go. And I'm just kind of shaking, and I'm holding the, the, the pulpit, and I'm just kind of like looking at her. And here comes her grandson running around by her down towards the stage. And I just buckle and hit the floor. Wow. And I'm beating the floor. Now, I, if you ever see me do this, it's not fun, because I'm trying to get unbelief out of me. I'm wow. yelling, I don't believe it, and I'm hitting the ground like that. <laughs> This is even more than being This is kind of exciting. Wow. And I'm just watching him run around. He's a happy little kid. And I mean, Jesus healed him. Okay. Now, I go home that night and I'm like, Lord, what is going on with me? He said, Well, Brian, that's how faith works. He says, When I give it to you, you can move in it. When it lifts off you, you're back to who you are. 
And I thought, well, that stinks because I'm, <laughs> I'm full of unbelief and doubt when you're not moving. Are you guys like that? Yeah. And, when, and you guys, you realize the gift of faith has nothing to do with you because he produces the results and you're stuck with wherever you're at and you're walk with him. And so if you're doubting him, he can still move through you and do all this stuff and you can fall right back into the ditch of doubt and unbelief. Wow. And that's the state I was in when God did that thing. That's why I argued with people and fought with them after I ministered to them, which was ridiculous. Who does that kind of stuff? I mean, I stopped that like last week fight. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So you guys ready? The gift of faith and the way that God does this is beyond your maturity level. It's a it's the love of God. He gives it to you in spite of your maturity. That's the wonderful thing about the Lord. And he's trying to get your thinking to catch up with. You ready? God does this because he's good. He doesn't do this because you understand everything perfectly. He doesn't do it because you had the perfect combination of B12 and not, not and didn't have unbelief or any of that stuff. God supersedes all that junk. He gives it because he's good. You guys pray with me. <laughs> So, Lord, faith is the assurance of things hoped for. I ask for a encounter for each of us tonight. That as we walk through the idea of how faith works inside of us, that the love of God would start going deeper into the root system of our understanding. That we would be people that rest in who you are instead of our ability to do something. Help us rest in you. Any religious performance that have been put on us, we break the power of that right now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and we just let go of that and we just grab the adventure of your Father's heart. And I command the Father blessing upon you in regard to you receiving the best he has for you. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen.